coming. Uh, we hope that you'll find a great deal of information that will be helpful in your wards and stakes tonight. This uh, presentation was originally put together to present to a multi-congregational faith, uh, faith-based entities so that we could get our brothers and sisters in faith together on the same page to be ready for when things come so that when if the time ever came that we needed to depend upon each other, we would be able to um, help out each other and not have our congregations doing things that our, uh, the pastors and our bishops and, and uh, leaders have been telling us all our lives not to do. Um, that it is built, this presentation is built on precepts of the church. It follows all the guidelines and uh, where applicable things in the plans are uh, re referenced. And uh, I'd like you to think for a minute, we are not an island. Um, sometimes we think of ourselves as individuals or as families or as wards or as neighborhoods or communities. Um, but all of those things are made up of individual people. First, I'd like to talk about what exactly is a disaster. And on a personal level, a disaster is relatively unexpected. Personal resources may be overwhelmed. Lives and physical health are endangered and mental health is stressed. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the most common disaster in the United States is a home fire. All disasters are personal and start at a individual level. Community disasters, again, are relatively unexpected. Emergency personnel may be overwhelmed. Lives, physical health, and the environment are endangered and mental health is stressed. Can you see that they're identical? Can you see that everything comes down to the individual and that as a community, Communities are people, wards are people, stakes are people. So that's where we need to start is at the ground, ground, um, ground roots here. The disaster cycle, there are three areas requiring separate and distinct approaches. Tonight, we're talking about the preparation part. And as a result, um, this involves individuals and families and uh, organizational or church readiness, ward readiness, Neighborhood readiness depends on overall preparedness of the individuals and their needs. The response comes after the fact. That's where the plans and the actions required to support the individuals during the event are already in place and you have those ready so you know what to do. Response continues until these basic services are restored. And the recovery part begins even during the response period where um, the organizational involvement um, is, uh, and is the recovery part does not end just because the um, perceived uh, pen, uh, disaster. disaster is over. Uh, for instance, um, using those same criteria that we had in the last slide, would you consider the pandemic a disaster? It was, and a lot of people don't, but are we still in a recovery mode from that? Absolutely, where things are opening up now, are people saying it's over? I don't know, but we're definitely in the recovery phase on that. There's also another component that sometimes is in, included in that, and that is mitigation. And that falls somewhere between recovery and preparedness, where um, you look over what happened, how can we fix things, what things can we do to change in order to prepare for the next thing for the next emergency. Now, one of the things we've tried to do here is preparedness is in some places a dirty word. It's something where you think somebody's building a, um, a oh, shelter, bomb, at, shelter. bomb shelter out in their backyard or whatever. And so personal readiness really is a, a good terminology for this. The handbook says the Lord's storehouse exists in each ward and stake. Leaders can often help individuals and families find solutions to their needs by drawing on the knowledge, skills, and service offered by ward and stake members. So what exactly is the, war, the Lord's storehouse? It is the ward and stake members. There's whole congregation versus individual family. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity where they have a ward goal in preparedness. Does that really work? Does that fulfill the need? 
um, is person individual and family readiness, personal readiness. Um, each individual family has specific needs to their own situation. You've got those that are just newlyweds, you have young singles, you have people with children at home, you have working moms and dads, you have empty nesters, you have various incomes and careers involved in each um, in your wards. Preparedness desires vary from each individual family. There are those who consider themselves done. They've gone to the, you know, the to Amazon and bought the backpack that tells them that they're set for three days and they put it in the closet and they're done and they're not interested in anything else. You've got those who just don't care or they figure somebody else is gonna take care of them. All the government or the church will come in and take care of us. Now remember the church is who? Their members. It's not this big welfare grain of wheat that's gonna come and take care of you. It's the individual members that are gonna become responsible for themselves and for each other. And then you, there are those who want to be ready, but don't know where to start or where to go from there. So where would you start? Um, our CERT mantra is to do the most good for the most people in the least amount of time. And this goes well with what we're talking about here as well. We, we, su we suggest supporting those who need the help or who are interested in going from uh, where they are now to a better place. Um, you do this by contacting individuals and families who have indicated an interest in help and you set up an appointment with them. Uh, what we've done is we've just passed, we've either had, had a fifth Sunday where we've presented something or we just get up and say, if you'd like to know where you want to go from here, if you're interested in moving on with your personal readiness, and if you use readiness, it sounds nicer, um, but if you... Uh, then we pass around a, a piece of paper and we'll get 10 or 12 families. But you know, when you get to thinking about it, that's a mom and a dad and in our wards, they're you know, usually three or four, five kids. So you're talking, instead of 10 families, you're talking about 50 people that, make, that you're helping to get ready. And we go, when we do this, we talk to them about preparing their top three goals or concerns. And um, one of the things that was up, well, we'll do it on the next slide, but you'll see um, what we're talking about needing to be specific, but they need to be specific as in not just, well, I wanna be better prepared. That needs to be something like, I would like a, a three month supply of food. I would like to have a, a, my go kits done and I'd like to know uh, how much of a generator I need or how much water I need, just three things, but not, um, it's better if they cover multiple subjects. Uh, and um, then we break those down into multi goals, one for each concern for each of the large goals. We discuss the resources needed and we work out together what is the next step. And the, one of the most important parts of this is the time element. When do you want me to call you? Me? When do you want me to call back? There is a when you have a return and report, people get it done because otherwise these things get put on the back burner. Now here are some areas of potential of individual and family goals for readiness. Uh, communications, nuclear family communications. We talked about that at our last um, thing, so we're going to refer back to that. But contact lists. These things are all free or pretty much. Um, evacuation plans and escape plans. We talked about, we, you know, I told you that the home fires are the most common disaster in the United States. Um, all of these things, or most of these things are all free. You don't, it doesn't, it's not expensive to be ready. Um, financial, emergency cash reserves, go through these things. Having adequate insurance as a Red Cross volunteer, I, we see so many people who, as renters, never took the time to spend the $20 a month to be insured, and they've lost everything. And renters' insurance is so much, um, it's not very expensive. And depending upon your time in life, do you need life, life insurance or end-of-life plans? I mean, it just depends upon where you are, where they are in their lives. Now, medical, being trained can save a life. And these are all things that can be used in everyday time and not just in times of, we want to be ready for whatever comes in. In most disasters are going to be personal. Um, food storage and gardening. You've been doing some wonderful classes on all of these, but you know, take a look at these. Um, 
one of the things that we've noticed that is alternative cooking sources and recipes, you need to try them to make sure they work. Um, and it, just like in communication, uh, you need to, if you only have one form of um, cooking ready, it's sure to fail. So two or more are needed in order to have a success. Um, emergency kits, vehicle kits, go kits, first aid kits, three minute kits, um, other ideas, commercial food prep certifications, forklift certification, uh, community emergency response team training, Red Cross, um, voluntary organizations active in disaster. Um, all of these are ways and elements that we can enlarge our um, effect and readiness for ourselves, our families, and others. Now, this is how it works. Um, we go into the family and suppose they say, well, my, get, my uh, goal is I want a go bag. And they've had one from five years ago. We talk about it. I'm not the go bag police. I'm not the one that's gonna go through their go bag and tell them what they have or the, what they shouldn't have. What we do is I'll say, um, what about if you go through your bag, just remove your old food and clothes that don't fit. And that's all I want you to do for your, for your you know, goal for this, um, for this time period. And then I ask them, when would you like me to call, call you back? And I record that. Um, if I'm supposed to bring something to it or help them with something, I make sure that I get them that resource. And then we uh, set the date and then I follow up, okay? And that's, like I say, that's the important part. Um, here, oops. Okay, um, here's another, this is an if then chart. It says, if they wanted to go kid, maybe start with a three minute kit. Um, that's where you have enough stuff for the first three minutes after you've had to evacuate. Do you already have a kit? If yes, if yes, again, we talk about the same thing that we did just there. If they don't, then I would supply at least three sources for ideas and then make a list that fits your own personal and family needs. Working from one list and saying, this is exactly what you need is not gonna fit or fulfill their needs as a family. Then for the next step, after they have gone through and um, made up their own list, the next step would be having a family home eating scavenger hunt for items on the list, and then list the items that you're missing. And then the next one would be posting a shopping list for future trips. Okay. And in, I, I know. And so we've gone through that, and we've gone through that very quickly because we need to have that basis in order for the plan to really work well. Well, I'll uh, cover the, the written plan. And, and the first question that I get most often when we start talking about this is, why do I need one? Uh, I put down a few ideas here, but the first one I wanted to put up was uh, from the general handbook uh, section uh, unit 22.7. Uh, says ward councils also prepare a simple written plan for the ward to respond to emergencies. Uh, if you go to the stake section, it also says the same things for the stake. So this plan should be coordinated with the stake's emergency plan, C section 22.9.1.3. Those are all things that are in the general handbook and the church is recommending and uh, I, I suppose you could call it a recommend uh, from the standpoint that uh, it's in the handbook and they're telling us that we should have one. Uh, so that's the first reason uh, that we would want to have one. The other thing is that we find that when uh, everything goes south, uh, when a, a real emergency happens, when you're driving down the road and an accident happens in front of you, uh, we had a good friend who was standing in a grocery line and the person in front of her suddenly collapsed. She was cert trained and she told us, what do I do? I mean, she, she really knew, but the panic sets in when something happens. And so having a written plan that you can go to helps you focus yourself and keep you on target and, and do the things that you've been trained or that you've thought that you wanted to do. Uh, the other thing that it does is uh, 
sometimes we get a tendency, uh, sometimes when I go with Claudia on these interviews with the families, I get way ahead of myself and she has to keep reining me in. But one thing we want to do is keep ourselves focused when we get into a situation that's uh, adverse, that's requiring some quick thinking or some response that is going to be beneficial to the members of the wards and the state. So um, you want to stay focused on the response and what you're trying to accomplish. And then the plan needs to be flexible enough that uh, for different situations, you can handle it. Uh, the, um, the handbook refers to this plan several times as a short or uh, written plan. Um, I have one here from my state, it's probably 128 pages. People would say that is not a short uh, written plan. However, in that plan, only the first eight and a half pages are the plan itself. The rest of it is supporting information, appendices that we've put in there to support the plan so that people can function properly. And I'll go through all of these elements in this as we go through this evening so that you can see how all of this works together. But the plan really does need to be short, it needs to be concise, it needs to state what you want to do and, and get you focused on heading the right direction. Uh, there are all sorts of different kinds of emergency response plans that we could talk about. Um, We've written one for our family that's just the two of us, but um, as we get older, if something happened to the both of us, we would want our children to be able to come in. We've buried both of our parents and we know what the problems are to, to go in and get through the, and find everything and, and just take care of everything. So we've created a family emergency response plan that in part includes where they can find our insurance policies and where all of the other stuff are so that they can uh, function when the time comes. It also would help either of us if we were left alone and had to deal with all of these things ourselves. Uh, so that there's that, the family emergency response plan. We can have a ward or a stake emergency response plan. And then there's also something known as a coup plan. And I'll talk more about those uh, as we go through and explain exactly what they are. Uh, here is the sections that I have in our stake and ward emergency response plan. This is just the plan, uh, not all of the appendices. We'll go through those separately here in just a second. But basically the first section would be a general introduction um, <clears throat> Right on the front, of, on the cover page of, of our stake and ward plans, uh, here's what it says on our stake plan. Stake emergency response plan uh, with associated appendices for use by the stake emergency response team. It is not for general dissemination. In other words, we're not gonna pass this out to all of the ward members. Uh, it's just for those who will be required to lead the response. This is not an official document of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is for the sole purpose of aiding the planning and response in certain catastrophic situations. Specific directions from church authorities may change the plan as required by their communications and directives. That is an important statement that people don't believe that this is coming from the church. This is something that is produced by the local unit to meet local types of uh, disasters that probably could or would occur in their area. And uh, so the church has shied away from giving us something that's written all the way around. But your introduction should uh, give state your, uh, your purpose for uh, putting it together, wants to also identify uh, periods of review. Uh, you'll find that things change rapidly. And so once a year, you probably should go through and just make certain that everything is up to date. So that's the introduction to the plan, just a short statement, a couple of uh, sections, uh, paragraphs. And uh, 
in the one that I have posted, uh, we actually have posted this in uh, Heidi's uh, files there, so you can pull it down and look at it. It's a blank plan that you can tailor for your own use. But basically, all the way through, I have referenced points uh, that are from uh, taken directly from the general handbook or for, from official publications of the church so that we can say that everything is in compliance with what the church wants and what we should be doing. The, uh, the second section of, of our plan is a short statement on the individual preparedness, as Claudia pointed out. Having prepared ward members means that if you're the bishop and have to step in in a major catastrophic situation, knowing that a great many of your ward members are prepared and were able to weather the storm or whatever it was, uh, is a positive thing. And so uh, the preparedness issue is, is an important aspect. The third section is emergency response team. In this section, we identify who the ward or stake emergency response team is. Basically, if it's a ward, it's going to be the bishopric, the elders quorum presidency, the relief society presidency, and any ward or uh, ward uh, specialists that may have been called for prepared and, and the ward clerks and, and, and all of the secretaries. These are basically the people that are outlined in the handbook as being responsible for the welfare of the membership of the church. And they'll be the people who will be responsible to making certain that the, the team functions or that, that there is a team and that something is going on for the benefit of the members. Uh, you don't need to list everybody by name with their phones and they're just basically say, this is who the team is. It's the bishopric and the clerks and et cetera, et cetera. And that's in the plan that you posted. Uh, section four is an emergency operation center. Where are these people going to meet in a uh, tough situation, and this can vary from situation to situation. So generally in there, we have a place in the plan for the primary meeting location, which is basically the bishop's office or the state president's office or the high council room. Um, that's the, the primary. Then there's a secondary. And what happens if there's a flood in the area and everybody has to evacuate, then you probably want a location that's out of area so that all of the members of the team know where to assemble so that they can take care of the needs of the members of the ward. That's called an emergency operations center. And all you need to do here is to define where those places will be. Uh, the fifth uh, section uh, is communications. We, taught, we spent a whole class uh, previously talking about communications on an individual and family basis. Now you've expanded this to the ward family or the stake family. And so communications are very uh, critical. They will fail. Uh, and so when we get back, uh, we'll talk more about that a little later, but basically, uh, this section of your plan just identifies what you have determined is the primary and maybe the secondary uh, method of communication that you're going to use to get messages out to the members of the ward. Uh, are there any questions at, to this point in time? Maybe we'll just, uh, I hadn't seen anything happen. Heidi, is anybody? Uh... Nope, not yet. Okay, very good. Um, section six is the an emergency response kit. Um, basically what it says here, identifies items to be kept in a response kit to be kept at the primary meeting location. So it's gonna have a copy of your plan. It's going to have pre-printed forms because the power may be out. You may not be able to run them all through your copy machine. 
So you're going to have all of those kinds of things. You're going to have a first aid kit there and other things that are, are identified and they're enumerated in section six of the, the format that I have sent out or provided for you to look at. Uh, things to think about that you would want in a tub, something that's kept there in the bishop's office or somewhere that's going to be available when you need it. Um, then the next section is how do we respond to emergencies? Uh, what are the first orders of priority and what's the information that needs to be collected? Uh, if you've been a bishop for very long or a state president for very long, you know that there are times when the next the level of ecclesiastical authority above you may give you a call or something and say, I heard this is going on in your area. Tell, give me a report on what's happening with your members. And I can guarantee that if it's a major situation, they're going to be at looking for certain information relative to the meeting house. Uh, the, the missionaries are a high priority for the church uh, and the members and their properties as well. And so you're going to be asked to give a report. And this section seven just identifies the information that you need to be collecting right away to get into uh, those who have a need to know. Uh, you understand that on the ward is where we minister or ad, uh, administer the, the programs where we take care of uh, the situation. The stake and the region, the area, the church itself are in supporting roles to help us. And so the more information we can pass along, the better it will go for every, the more support we will get at, to caring for these things. So that little section seven just basically goes briefly through those things that you need to be collecting and who you get that information to. Uh, section eight is uh, what I would consider to be a very important one, uh, use of or, uh, the church facilities in an emergency situation. Uh, I have heard so many times people say, well, we'll just pack up and we'll go down to the church and we'll meet at the church. Um, that may be a good starting point, but if you follow and there are, we'll talk more about this a little later, there are some actual policies that the church has with regards to using the church as a shelter, uh, what you can do and what you cannot do. And uh, Knowing what those things are will certainly help you as a leadership to not step beyond the bounds of what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, section nine is something that I have added. It's called a cooperative agreement. When we were at the Paradise Fire in uh, California, that fire roared through that community in less than a day. There were 80,000 people living on the hill one way in and one way out. And uh, it was a miracle that only 80 some 80 plus people were killed as a result of that fire. The one thing that we learned in that situation when we went there to work uh, with the Red Cross, we were assigned to find the people that came off that mountain and just disappeared at, dissipated into the surrounding communities. And so there were lots of friends and family who were looking for them and didn't know where they were at. And that was our job was to find certain of these people. We found out in doing this task that there had been a cooperative agreement between the stake in the area where the fire roared through and a couple of adjacent stakes and the, the cooperative agreement was that you can come here if you have to evacuate and we'll help you get settled and help you get the people taken care of. And we'll give you a place for your uh, ward emergency or your stake emergency response team to meet and to function. And uh, so there was a cooperative agreement. Since that time, I have heard uh, from 
area authorities that uh, the church was so pleased with how well that happened. And believe me, it, it was a miracle, the things that happened and how that all worked. Uh, because there had been this previous planning that they actually uh, encourage wards and state, especially states to have cooperative agreement with adjacent states uh, in their area or they can work with each other and help each other out in tough situations. So I've added a section nine on cooperative agreements, which identifies what the what's going to happen and what the two stakes can do for one another. Uh, section 10 is recovery. Uh, that's the third leg of the disaster cycle that uh, Claudia and it, uh, brought, uh, showed you earlier. Uh, basically, the work of the ward emergency response team, the ward council, the state council, the bishop's council, the work of all of those people is not completed until every member is taken care of to the best to the best situation that they can and to help them recover to a new normal situation. And so that's recovery. Uh, then there's the final section, which is called the list of, uh, and description of appendices. I told you my plan was 128 pages long. This that you see right here on this page was nine pages of that 128. All of the rest of it is supporting information, appendices that give more information on all of the individual sections that we've looked at here uh, so that when the time comes, uh, you don't have to be an expert, but um, you'll have a place to go. Uh, oh, I was gonna mention one thing. For those of you who are bishops and state presidents, uh, and you're worried about taking on the responsibility of uh, leading a ward em emergency response team or a state emergency response team, the handbook for the first time has now said that the bishop can uh, uh, delegate some of those responsibilities to a person in the ward who has those skills and abilities. Uh, however, there are some guidelines with regards to welfare uh, and those kinds of situations that only the bishop and the stake president can take care of. So they can be busy doing their thing while someone else runs the emergency response in the stake uh, with the, under the direction of the stake presidency or the ward, the bishop. Uh, any questions to this point in time before we get into the appendices? Feel free to unmute if you do have any questions also, but there are no um, questions in the chat at this time. Okay. Uh, one thing that is always, you know, I've presented this plan all over the church, <laughs> uh, literally. And um, it's just one way of doing it. But the comment that I get most is just give me a checklist. That's all I want. Just give me a checklist and we'll be okay. And that uh, is a, a help, but probably will not cover all of the situations that you're, you're going to want your plan to do. Uh, so Appendix A and Appendix B of the plan Appendix A is a quick guide if danger is approaching. Some uh, disasters are things that uh, give us a little bit of time to prepare for. Uh, think of the hurricanes in the Gulf Coast, or sometimes the weather conditions are such that uh, the uh, NOAA or the National Weather Service will issue tornado warnings for your area. Um, so you'll have a little bit of time to kind of get a few things together in your mind before something drastic really happens. So this Appendix A is a quick guide. It's a checklist where you can just go down and you can kind of get your mind ordered around the approaching danger and uh, get things ready to go. 
Appendix B are for those things where they come out of the blue and there's no time. Uh, they just happen and now we have to respond to them. We haven't had the, the pre preparation time. So it's an, again, a checklist of things that you can do. Now, <clears throat> you notice under Appendix B, there's something that uh, says, uh, refers to a playbook. This is a brand new concept that Claudia and I ran into as we attended a seminar at the local university here um, recently for all of the emergency managers and people in our half of the state that uh, are working in this, uh, in this field. And uh, so I'm gonna explain the playbook for you a, a little later, but it's a more detailed a checklist than these Appendix A and Appendix B. Appendix C is the place where um, we talk about communications. Uh, if you go back and you look at the class that we did a few weeks ago, uh, we talked about the strengths and weaknesses of different types of communication uh, platforms. And we were uh, telling you how to use those in your personal and individual situations. Well, this is nothing more than the same thing carried to a little bit further extreme for a larger group of people. Uh, weighing out what are going to be the methods that you're going to depend on to get information from the ward emergency response team or stake emergency response team out to the members in a quick and efficient way. Uh, so the, the little point down at the bottom is the kind of a mantra that's used often in communications and emergency. Uh, if you have one method of communications and that's all you have, then you probably have, you don't have any communications because it will probably fail. But if you have two or more, you may have one that uh, works for you. So part of the guidelines for emergency communication would be weighing out the strengths and the weaknesses of each method that you're looking at, determining under what conditions you might expect it to fail and under what conditions you might expect it to be your best candidate for methods of communication. So this is a support to the communication section in the plan itself. The plan may just briefly outline what communication methods you're going to use. This is going to have all of the information. We use some amateur radio network, networks in ours. And so in Appendix C of our state plan, we have a list of all of the licensed amateur radio operators and their call signs. And uh, so the uh, frequencies that we would use uh, on the radio to make contact with the, all of these people. So these are things that you put in great detail in Appendix C, but you're not gonna spend a lot of time detailing in the plan. Otherwise the plan gets too big and too hard to, uh, to use. <clears throat> So communications is a very important thing. We spent a whole two hours on it before. Uh, please go back and review that. I can't spend any more time on this here tonight other than what I've just said. Uh, Appendix D. Uh, while we were uh, living in another state, a major wildfire roared through our area of the uh, county and the city that we were in. And uh, <clears throat> a little congregation, church congregation, uh, of about 85 to 150 members was all, uh, just a small um, Christian congregation, decided to do some Christian service for the community and opened a shelter. After about three days, the church was in deep trouble, deep financial trouble, because it takes lots of money 
and lots of uh, know-how to operate a shelter. And uh, it almost bankrupted this little church. Uh, fortunately, certain members of the government in that area were able to step forward and help them out and get them connected with some places that could help them get beyond this. As a result of that, what the church has done has said that we're not going to use our buildings as shelters unless we do so in cooperation with the American Red Cross. They've even gone so far as to sign a memorandum of understanding between the American Red Cross and uh, the corporation of the presiding bishopric to specify how church buildings could be used and that the Red Cross would, would uh, operate those. The Red Cross, when they do a shelter, comes in, they do an initial survey of the building, they take pictures of any existing damage. When everything is all through and all of the shelter people are out, they go through and they take pictures of uh, any new damage and the Red Cross will pay for it. They also take care of the food, security, and all sorts of other things that you wouldn't think of as needing. So the church has some very specific uh, guidelines with regards to using buildings as shelters or how they would be used in an emergency situation. They can be found in a uh, gospel library. Uh, there is a point in here, I think we'll, uh, there is a, a slide in here, I think that tells you how to get to it and find this, a copy of the memorandum of understanding and all of the policies that go along with this. So don't get yourself in a problem. And without this in your appendix, it's going to be difficult for you to respond in that regard type of a situation. Appendix E is what we call the ICE or in case of emergency contact list. Uh, it's a written list of, um, I know we all have our ward directories on our phones and smart devices, we, uh, but who knows what you're gonna have in the time of a real situation. And so Appendix E has all of the lists it has the, the phone number of the mission president. Um, it has the phone number of the bishop's storehouse, uh, how to get in touch with area authorities. Uh, all of those kinds of things are in there so that you have them at your fingertips when you need them. Uh, and so having it written out as a written directory and updated periodically is a good thing. Uh, for emergency situation. Appendix F in our plan is a place where we put member directories. Uh, our ward is a very small, compact uh, area, uh, as opposed to probably what you're experiencing out in uh, Wisconsin, which may be larger ward areas. So we can use zones or other means of contacting and finding out how people are doing. Uh, but basically, copies of the maps, the contact lists, uh, if you use calling trees, copies of those calling trees, who's responsible to initiate it or how can it be initiated if that person is not around. Those kinds of things are in Appendix F and make life that much easier when you get into a situation, especially when the situation starts causing uh, failure of some communications methods. So this is all valuable information that you need to have written out and available to you. Appendix G uh, is the missionary directory. Now, the missionaries uh, don't stay long uh, in an area, and you'd be forever changing your plan to do that. So what we do is list their apartments, 
because they generally transfer in and stay in the same apartments. They use the same phone numbers. They're assigned to specific wards in your stake uh, or just two missionaries to your whole stake or however it's done in your mission. Um, so we have a list of where these missionaries are, where they're assigned to, uh, generally speaking, not by name, but uh, by apartment. And then in all of our ward plans, we have a responsibility for the ward members to find these missionaries when something bad happens, to take care of them, <clears throat> to give a report to the state president who can pass that information on to the mission president. And as you're aware, he will be most interested to know how his uh, service representatives, church service representatives are doing and whether they're okay, because he'll have a lot of parents call. Appendix H would be maps, and they can be anything from uh, zone maps, like we have in our ward. <laughs> <clears throat> to maps of the whole area, showing locations of emergency uh, locations, fire stations, hospitals, and other things that might be needed. Um, just any maps that you feel like would be possible. Uh, when a tornado runs through an area, the pictures I've seen, all of the landmarks are gone. And having a paper map to go by. Uh, instead of turning left at the Sister Jones's house, uh, you may need something a little more than, than that on a paper map to find your way around. Appendix I is all of the forms. The church has a number of them, and we've created a few ourselves to uh, help collect the information. Uh, the church has forms that deal with uh, work projects, signing up, uh, order forms for emergency supplies, uh, all of those things. Uh, you should have a master copy in the plan, and you should have multiple copies in the uh, emergency in the response kit, the emergency response kit. So. Um, you want all of those things to be available and, and know what they are. Appendix J, uh, this is public safety and community organization contacts. The one that's in your plan has all sorts of things. I did not clean it up. It has a lot of uh, organizations that are endemic to our area. But the point and the reason I didn't clean it up is that I wanted uh, you to see the length that you may want to go to to find out what these organizations are in your community. These are community organizations, not church organizations. So they're going to be uh, uh, the hospitals, um, with suicide prevention and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, Bishop, if you knew and had that right at your fingertips, even if it's just counseling a personal uh, person in your ward, who is struggling and contemplating suicide, you want to get them help immediately. And having those uh, contacts and those kinds of things in your ward plan are just going to be absolutely uh, valuable beyond what you can believe. So look at your community, find out the organizations that are available there and uh, list them and get some phone numbers for them. Appendix K, public relations policies. This generally does not have anything in it in most of the plans because public relations situations, uh, speaking on behalf of the church, the church has uh, some very specific policies. You may want to put some of those in there, um, but generally there are area authorities who have responsibilities to these kinds of things to speak on behalf of the church. And so uh, anything that would keep you from having people saying things that they shouldn't say representing the church 
can go in Appendix K. Appendix L is what I consider to be the real meat of the plan. And that's where we have gone through and identified a number of typical scenarios that are endemic to our area. And then we have written some specific plans as to what we would do if those things happen. L1 is what we call a continuity of operations plan. I will explain a little bit more about that in just a bit. Uh, L2 was a, uh, uh, a, a direct publication from the church when we went into the COVID lockdowns and stuff like that, where they were talking about uh, ordinances and how we would carry those kinds of things out. And I just copied that and put it in the plan because it is such great information on when things go south, how you continue to function and operate in the church and continue to get the, the priesthood blessings and those kinds of things taken care of. Um, L3 is some general information on situation reports and incident action plans. You can read that if you want to. Uh, you may use them, you may not use them in your situation. L4, we have a dam just up the uh, river from or up the drainage area from where we live. Uh, if it failed, and believe me, the people of Idaho are extremely sensitive to that, having the Teton Dam failed uh, previously. Um, if that dam were to fail, we'd have about uh, two and a half to three hours to get evacuated from our area before the floodwaters would come through this area. Uh, you'll notice a little asterisk there, and you'll notice the asterisk next to earthquake, pandemic, wildfire, and severe weather or winter storms. Those are playbooks, and I'm going to explain those playbooks to you here in just a second. But you can see where we've identified specific types of situations and how the ward plan could be made operational in those situations. So, and what other things you need to be thinking about in those specific situations that may be different from a, another type of disaster that could happen in your area. So those are the appendix plans um, that we have created. Uh, I'll, Pause here for just a second before I get into playbooks. Are there any questions that anybody has? Actually, I do. Um, all of those appendages, are they in your, sorry. So I have a Google Drive that I've set up that I sent out to everybody who's on my email list. If you are not on my email list, please put your email in the chat before the end. And I will send you out the link to this Google Drive. And in this Google Drive, there are a lot of, um, of checklists and um, forms to fill out for this. So what you were just talking about, those appendages, are those in this information that you sent for this Google Drive sent me? They are completely, uh, again, here's the reason that I put that together in the format that I did. I, I sanitized it, took out most all of the information that was personal relative to the people around here, there is some of that left in there only to give you an idea as to what you might want to do with your section. Uh, but basically, if I could uh, sanitize it completely and take like uh, the, in case of emergency contacts, those pages are in there and it has a place for you to type in the state president's name and his counselors and their contact information and the high council and the bishop's council. That's all in the state plan and the ward plan. There are other uh, contact points in there as well. So those things are all there, but they're not uh, specific. Uh, the concept here is I have no pride of authorship in any of this stuff. In fact, I would be honored if you wanted to plagiarize it and use it in any way that it works for you. And so that's what's been provided to you. It's a help because some of this stuff can be daunting. 
Many of you have not had the experiences that I have had, and I don't expect you to be thinking along the same lines that, as I do in these situations. I just want to share thoughts and ideas that you can use and uh, do more advanced uh, research on. So I talk in the earthquake section, I talk about earthquakes in, in Idaho and, uh, and this area of Idaho is the second uh, highest number of measurable temblers in the United States behind California. So, uh, but most of the people around here don't even notice them. They don't even think that they're gonna happen until a big one does. So, uh, you guys live not too far from the New Madrid fault. Uh, there are lots of things that could happen in your area. So you may want to do a little research on it, but you can certainly use what I have put in there as a pattern and plan and utilizing uh, the planning that goes into that if it fits your needs and what you decide you want to do. So please use them copy them, change them, make them fit what you need. That's the idea. Does that answer your question, Heidi? Yep, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> the new thing that I have added to uh, all of these play, uh, are, are all of these uh, plans for the various types of disasters are what we call playbooks. Is basically it was a, a military construct. It, it's also a sports construct um, where a team, football team, for example, may <clears throat> go through and plan the first 25 plays of the game to test out the, uh, the defense of the other team or whatever they, they're trying to accomplish. The military picked up on that and uses it in their emergency response planning all the time to identify specific tasks and responsibilities of specific people or uh, functions in order to make everything work. And so when we heard about this, we thought, you know, this is an answer to the question that most of the people had. Just give us a playbook or just give us a checklist. And so um, <clears throat> the playbooks are an attempt, and I'll show you one here. This is uh, from the general area flooding playbook. Uh, in ours, it's the Ryrie Dam failure or general, general area flooding if the river running through your area overflows its banks. What do we do? Um, so you can see that the, the way the playbook is organized is that we have play number one. For play number one, we give a general description of what, you know, what the time period is and what the condition is going to be. So uh, play number one for that, I told you that in three hours we could be inundated with water from that dam. So for the first three hours, it's general ward evacuation. This is from our ward plan. Uh, the objective is to safely evacuate all members within the designated flood zones as directed by the, our county uh, office of emergency management and establish a base upon which to verify status of all the members. Think now, they're all leave, picking up and leaving. How are you going to tell uh, church leadership how are you going to make certain that the missionaries got picked up? You know, all of these questions that you need to answer. Uh, so we want to deal with how we're going to get those answers for them. So I've broken it down into tasks uh, for the bishopric, the elders quorum presidency, the relief society presidency, the emergency preparedness specialists, and in our area, the zone captains. So basically, those are a checklist of things that they need to be doing during that first three hours in order to start things heading the right direction. Again, rather than freezing up and wondering what I should do, this gives you a very step-by-step -step approach to what 
should be done. And I have done, um, yeah, um, Claudia is pointing out that I, I put some stuff in here, like uh, secure your personal family and evacuate to uh, the Foothill stake is one of our partner stakes uh, that we've been working with. And so that is, uh, so we will have the address in there as to where they want to evacuate to so that we can get a tally on all of the people and make certain that they all got out um, and those kinds of things. So that goes back to the rest to the main plan saying, where are we going to meet up and where is our ward emergency operations center going to be set up? Well, we've made arrangements with the Foothills State to use one of their buildings. They're in higher ground and not covered by the flood area. They, however, are in areas where wildfires can sweep through and we're in more of a, an urban area that would not necessarily have that same problem. So we can cooperate and support them should they have a problem. So that's what's going on here. This is how we utilize the plan, the basic simple plan, all of the appendices that we've just been through and create a step-by-step -step thing for a particular type situation that will help us get to where we want to get to. It's not totally complete in every step that needs to be done, but if you start along this plan, it will take you from step to step and as other things occur, and disasters are infamous for what we call cascading events, that is, uh, you may have an earthquake, but uh, you may also end up with fires roaring through large areas of the town caused by broken gas mains or those kinds of things. Power outages, Power outages is another cascading event that happens as a result of the earthquake itself. So a lot of different situations that will occur as a result of just that major uh, situation that happened. So uh, this is just play one of the playbook and there are about six or seven plays in this uh, situation. Some of them are repeating play, uh, plays until the situation becomes normal once you get past certain steps. But um, in, the, uh, in the appendix for flooding or for earthquake or for any of those other things that has the asterisk that says there is a playbook in them, there is a playbook specific to that type of situation that they can do. And that's what the playbook is all about. We think it's a great idea. As soon as we heard about it, we immediately started to <clears throat> add these. Uh, I've already given copies of these to our stake presidency and to our uh, ward bishopric. They've been extremely well received uh, by them and, uh, and recognized as a possible really great help if a situation were to occur. So that's uh, something brand new that we've just added and I think is a great uh, concept. <coughs> Excuse me. A coop plan, not a chicken coop. Uh, it's basically a continuity of operations plan. That's what a government agency calls it. Um, so, but businesses also have same things that they call business continuity planning. The concept is um, to help the business or the government agency or whatever understand what the important essential and non-essential functions of the organization are and what they need in order to make those things function properly. And the goal of that is to allow us then using that information to identify what we need to do to ensure the critical things occur. Now the church is not a, a business organization that's gonna fail or whatever uh, per se as a result of a disaster, but 
There are certain functions identified in the scriptures, like having sacrament meetings on uh, this on Sabbath day, um, being able to get um, sacrament to members on on long term situations. Uh, those are what I would consider to be essential services and functions of the church. And so identifying those, <clears throat> identifying policies and procedures that the church has relative to that will help as you make your plans as a ward or a stake in an emergency situation to not forget the essential church functions that need to continue to go on. And, and what are non-essential, what are, would be nice, but are not essential to the, the brothers and sisters in our stakes and wards. In a disaster, the emotional and spiritual well-being is going to be severely tested and having this in place will help maintain that balance so that they have the essential ordinances that they need to support and um, support their testimonies and their, um, um, no. Yeah, so yeah, if, you, you know. <laughs> if you go back uh, to the appendices, <clears throat> the first appendix that I have uh, in Appendix L, the first uh, section, is continuity of operations plan, where we discuss what those important things are. And then the second one are is that document from the church on essential ordinances, blessings, and other church functions. Those Com comprise what I would consider to be the COOP or the uh, organizational uh, operation, uh, continuity of operations plan. Uh, so those are highlighted and written out in the, in the COOP plan that I have in there. And certainly not all inclusive, but I've tried to identify the things that are, would be considered essential. Uh, lastly, we're, we're getting to the end here. Um, we've talked about preparedness. Uh, we've talked about response. Now this is recovery. Uh, recovery generally starts seamlessly during the recovery or the response period. You're going to learn that so-and-so was injured or somebody else died or other things, uh, someone's home was destroyed, they got out okay. All of those things start to come as you get in, as you're in the response, but they're going to require long-term uh, help for those people to get them back on their feet and going, and that's the response or the, the recovery aspect of the thing. So it, the, these things will start seamlessly during the response activities, but they will continue long after. So you see in some places like uh, where uh, hurricanes came through certain cities in the South, depending upon how badly they were damaged, they're still working on uh, recovery operations there even though the hurricane was actually many years ago. And so these can go on for long periods of time and we put this in on recovery here in the plan uh, so that we don't lose sight of the fact that we're not through as brothers and sisters and as priesthood and ward leaders and stake leaders until we have been able to help those people adversely impacted as much as possible until they can move on to uh, what would now be considered a new normal normalcy in their lives. It's basically, recovery is basically gospel founded Christian policies and Christian service. It's ministering, it's what the church has identified. But the ward council and needs to keep these recovery methods in their mind 
as they move ahead and even long after the actual incident has passed until we can take care of those people and get them healed emotionally and spiritually. Um, I just want to inject something here. Um, as we look down this list, uh, some of the serious recovery activity, I'm going to go back to the pandemic comment that I made. Um, death as a result of the event, insurance collection issues or lack of insurance, um, loss of jobs or places of employment, uh, recovery assistance, assistance provided by governmental or other private groups. All of these things, again, relate back to that one, which was a nationwide, a worldwide disaster. And um, I don't know if you're aware, but the federal government has a program that if you know someone or if you've been so unfortunate as to have a loved one pass away due to the COVID or complications from the COVID, they have offered up to $9,000 worth of reimbursement for funeral, for funeral costs. I have that information. If anyone would like that, it is, oh, you know, we'd love to get that out to anyone who could utilize that. And you just need your receipts and send them in. And they are very good. They handle every case personally. And um, so if anyone is interested in that information, we will get that to Heidi as well. That pretty much covers our presentation this evening. Again, we were not able to go in and really provide you with the language of all of the sections. We were just trying to identify what goes into a plan and the things that you need to think about. Like I mentioned earlier, we have provided the plan, a copy of a plan uh, as a place to start and uh, Please feel free to utilize it, to chop it up, whatever works for you, start soon so that when something terrible happens, you as leadership in your wards and in your stakes are prepared and ready to support in the way that the Lord would have us support. Uh, that's that's our, our goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave and Claudia. Um, what an absolute wealth of knowledge that you've shared and how many years of experience that you've put into this. That was amazing. Um, I just wanted a question. So I've been going through the Google Drive that I can send out to everybody and I'm gonna also post the link on our YouTube channel. Um, I just wanted to verify. So you have a whole thing of a blank ward emergency for 95 pages and then like 116 for the stake emergency plans. So for us just beginning, is it best to like just start with this blank thing and just start filling in in the hole? Start with page one, then go to page two. And because I see as you go through the whole beginning, it explains it. And then you break out those appendices and you have the blank forms also in, in that. So to start for a ward or a stake, we just go ahead and start on page one and move on. I understand that the appendices are there to support the plan. They are information that one would want to have available to make the plan work for that particular, for that particular situation because the, the, the plan cannot be all inclusive. Uh, otherwise, it gets unwieldy and you can't use it. It's, it gets too big. And that's, uh, that's why I would start with the plan itself, determine what's important. Uh, probably if you're going to do a ward plan, you'd want to get your ward council together at some time uh, and go through all of this information and say, what do we want to do here? What's important to us in these areas? and utilize the language or change it as it fits your needs and your situation. Work on the plan itself. Once you've got that first nine pages done, the first, the plan, then you can go into all of the appendices and start filling in all of the information. You know, uh, the first thing you're gonna, if there was a mass evacuation, who are the people that are gonna have trouble evacuating from the area? Who are our aged people who have no transportation? 
who are our latchkey kids who are home alone and mom and dad are stuck somewhere else and can't get out? What are we going to do as the ward to get take those people taken care of? That's when you start getting into the appendices and you start filling in who those people are so that you don't forget. And that's where when, if you do the individual and family preparedness or readiness, where you go in and you talk to them, that's when you find out this information so that it can be funneled into the um, information sheets so for, the, for the response team. And uh, when you work with the council, they understand what their job as a response team is. A lot of them don't even realize they are it. <laughs> And yet, if you think about it, of course, the ward council is, or those people are the people who are, will be handling it. And if they have an idea, it's always nice, you know, um, if you think through a scenario and you think, if this happened, what would I do? Like, for instance, when I go to the movie theater, I sit there and I think, if I needed to leave quickly, where are my escape exits? I mean, that's just how my mind thinks anymore. But then I sit there and I go, okay, if I need to leave quickly, I know how to get out of there. But if something came in, I'd be going, where is it? Where is it? So if you think through these scenarios, if you have some basic guideline to start with, it may not work specifically or exactly, but you have a baseline there and it can be massaged for each time because each flood is going to be different. Each disaster is going to come through a little bit different than the last one. No two are the same. No families are the same. It just isn't it, but it's a good baseline. And once you have that, then with the supporting information, you can massage it and make it work for you. You, you the, um, I've heard you talk a little bit about your stake and how large an area it covers and those kinds of things and how many different units you have there. Our stake has 10 wards and they all reside within a two square mile area. Uh, so that's completely different than what you have there. I know that. And so I've tried to make this as... The West Culture Shock work moving from California where that wasn't the case either. <laughs> so, so, you know, we can do things a little differently here than I would imagine you can do things there. But again, we've tried to provide a basic foundation where you can think through these things as Claudia was talking about and have a place to start and then decide what makes sense for us. What do we need to do here? And like I say, keep it simple, keep it short on your plan, and then use the appendices to give you all of the supporting information that you need to make the plan work. Perfect. All right, anybody else have questions? Open mic time. Or are you just lost? <laughs> no, I, I, I'll just add uh, this. I'm Bishop Lefevre with the Janesville Ward. Um, I just see it as an opportunity to take some of this and, and start where we're at. Um, and we've got some older plans, but it's time to have some of those updated. And so just the materials and, and listen to the different scenarios that you talked about, I think helps tremendously. Yeah, take a look at it. And I think you'll find that there's a lot more to think about than you thought. <laughs> See, one, one thing we also found effective here, I didn't mention it during the presentation, but uh, we, our state presidency is supportive of us and, and we have uh, at least an annual or semi-annual conference where we have the leadership come in and we give them some training. The last training we did was a winter storm scenario and so basically what we asked the, the ward groups, we had them all sit in their ward group. We gave them the scenario and we said, all right, in your ward plan, where do you go to find what we would do first for this situation? Then we started throwing a few injects. Uh, that is now some, this has happened in your ward. Where in your plan does it discuss that? And we found that that was probably the most effective training that we did. If you want to do something like that, I can provide you, Bishop, uh, with uh, if you wanted to get your ward council together and just make them understand where you're at 
uh, I'll give you that uh, that scenario, and you can just go through with with them, and they can determine in themselves whether it was, you know, whether they need to do some additional work in some areas. It was very effective. We've had some wards who were not doing anything suddenly become our staunchest supporters after going through that exercise because they really realized how real some of the stuff can get and how quickly it can turn very sour, uh, sour on them. So. Any other questions? So, so Bishop, uh, if you want, just let Heidi know and she can get in touch with us and we'll upload that uh, information if you're- Okay, able. I appreciate that. Yeah. And you can always contact us directly. We don't, we don't mind. Okay. Is that information that I could just put on the Google Drive? Yes. Yes, it is. Why don't you just send that or just put it into the Google Drive? That it's, would be perfect. Uh, it's, it's the it's, last slide on there has not, our contact information. Yeah, the, our last slide has it, but the- The situation for Bishop Lefebvre. The situation Lefebvre. Oh, okay. that we did, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that- um, was very specific, but you can see what you could do and how to create the injects that you would add to it. We started with the same basic scenario. Right, could you put it in the Google Drive? We can put that in there, just to understand that it was very specific, specific to a situation sure. and that you'll want to tailor it to what you want to do. And what they did, what he did is not only did he have that, that scenario specific for our area, but after the initial incident, each ward got an inject that either supported, so they knew they went, you know, pat me on the back, I did this good, or it, it, it identified a hole in their plan. So if they said, um, you know, so they went, oh, I don't know, how are we going to do this? So it made it so that they had to think a little bit about it. And that's what was so good about it. They, they could they became familiar with their plan. They saw where the holes were. They saw what they thought would really work well. And it, um, and it helped them also identify why it was so important to have individual and family readiness because they realized they could not be good support to their ward without the support of the ward for them in that manner. So I'll, we'll, I'll upload that to, I'll have to go uh... <laughs> well, I, I know where it's at, but I'll have I may have to modify it just a little bit to, to make it so that it's useful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That is wonderful. Yeah, this I think we're starting from ground zero out here. And as you said, we're a 15 unit stake. We were a 16. They took one out. So yeah, <laughs> we stretch far and wide. So, so you're um, not, just just because you think you're at ground zero, you're not much different than the rest of the troop so. <laughs> yeah, we're we're at ground one now since we've had this. So thank you, thank you again so much for everything, for sharing all your knowledge and your decades of experience with us. We so appreciate it. And for the rest of you, um, Steve, I got your email. I'll send you the information. And anybody else, please put your information in if I haven't. But for those of the rest of you, I do. I will get this downloaded to YouTube in the next couple of days, and you can see it there with the rest of the links. So thank right, you. Yeah, and I have your links already, so I'm perfect. I, I hope you all realize what a gem you have in Heidi. No, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. You're hired. I'll pay you later. <laughs> well, and, and and the fact that she found us, uh, you know, it amazes me. I don't know. We're we're way, a long ways away from Madison, Wisconsin. So a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again so much, and thank you guys all for joining us too. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Hey, thank so, you very much. And good to you. meet you. Be ready. <laughs> Will do. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.